Today is surely an exceptional day as we will be having our honorable speaker, Mr. Karun Suk Song Hong, PhD, the Associate Dean, Head of Accounting and Finance Department from Faculty of Management and Tourism, Burafa University. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Karun Sung Song Hong. Very good morning, everyone. Okay. Um, good morning, I'm Karun from Burapai University, Thailand. Burapai University is located in Chomburi province, just beside Bangkok and very close to Pattaya city. Um, today I'm going to talk about investment based on the return distribution and portfolio optimization. I'm choosing this, this topic because um, I observed from Thai society, we found that Thai people has really little financial literacy and then they face the future problem in terms of retirement quality, all right? So I have been teaching finance for more than 10 years and found that people don't know how to save money, how to invest money, and how to create their future retirement profile, okay? So this is my topic today. All right, for example, um, I keep the example of the stock return this is a stock return from bank industry in Thailand. I choose about eight stock. So this is the data that you can normally extract from um, your stock market, right? And then this is the data set from 2009 until 2014, like that. So from this data set, what this data set telling you is tell you nothing, isn't it? Because it's spreadsheet. So if you want to make this data set become more informative, you need to plot it, something like that. So I choose one stock, which is Bank of Ayutthaya. It's kind of old bank in Thailand, and plot this graph. What this graph telling you? It's a return from 2009, where is that? Here, until 2014. Only one thing that you know is the return is very fluctuated. This is only one thing that you know. Anything else? Don't know. So to make it more informative, just transfer to the distribution. So from this distribution, there are so many information inside. Many of you may not like statistics. Some of you may not like mathematics. But believe me, this simple statistic can make you um, reach the freedom when you retire, all right? So this is a distribution of the return. What we can see here is, here is a mean, right? It's a center, and then there's a distribution like that. We call it normal distribution, okay? Let's look at this. So I will get into the theory a bit. We talk about probability distribution. Normally in the US, um, we talk about two moments, which is the first one, mean, and the first and the second one, oh sorry, the first one mean, and the second one is variance. We talk about that. You know what does it mean mean, right? Mean is average value, which is the center point of the distribution. Meanwhile, the variance talk about the spread or the deviation from the center point. The wider the spread, the higher the variance, the higher standard deviation. All right, so I would like to introduce another two measure, which is here, skewness, here, and kurtosis. How many of you here have heard these two words before? Skewness, wow, surprise. And kurtosis, okay, good. We talk in the same language already, okay. So this is something that when I teach my Thai student, they will say, what the hell is that? What is skewness? What is kurtosis? They never heard about it. It's good that you know about it, right? Okay, so touch the basic first. I'm talking about variance. Variance talk about the spread or the deviation from the mean, from the center point. So from this curve, which one is not good? The red one or the blue one? Of course, the blue one, right? Because it spread and deviate 
from the center line here. Center line is green line. So the red one is contract at the center. It means the probability of the event is close to the mean value. And another, uh, this is a solution, sorry. This is example of normal distribution. It's very difficult for a stock exchange in Thailand to find stock that normally distributed. This is one of them, okay? So you will see that the curve is like the bell curve here. It's a bell curve, right? And then this is a center point. Maybe my finger is better. This is the center point and then the spread, right? So it's look normally distributed. <clears throat> Another property of normal distribution is that between um, minus one and one SD, the probability will be the, oh, so, so <coughs> the probability density will be about 68%. Meanwhile, um, the space between minus two SD to two minus two SD is about 95% and 99% for three SD to minus three SD, right? This is the property of normal distribution. And this is what we call skewness, isn't it? The skewness talk about symmetry. So you can see from here, the curve is not symmetry anymore, but bias to one side. We call this one left skew distribution. Some people call it negative distribution. Why? Because the tail of the beast of the distribution is lying on the negative side, isn't it? Right? So the positive skew will be something that contrasts the tail will be on the right hand side or the positive value. So I compare normal distribution with the left skew distribution. You will see that the tail of the red charge is content or contract on the left-hand side. What does it mean for the stock market here? It means there's a chance that your stock experienced negative return, right? Negative return. And then if the skill turn to the right-hand side here, it means your stock has experienced to gain highly positive return. Understand that? Okay. So as an investor, which one you prefer? Positive skill or the negative or the negative skill? We prefer positive skill, right? We prefer here. We prefer the distribution that tend to the right hand side or the positive skill. So interesting thing is that most of the stock listed in ASEAN country shows positive distribution, which means you have a chance to get lottery ticket, to win the lottery ticket with highly positive return. Meanwhile, the stock listed in US or Europe mostly show the normal distribution. So there's no chance like us. So for ASEAN people, you should be able to say that we love stock that present positive skill. Right. This is what we call kurtosis. Kurtosis talk about the tail here. Yeah. How big is the tail? How fat is the tail? We call it fat tail, right? Big fat tail. Fat tail is good or bad? What do you think? This is something really new. This theory is quite newly developed. We talk about mean, we talk about variance for a long time, since 1952, but skewness is quite new. Kurtosis is very new, and the theory is not solid yet. We like fat tail or we like thin tail? What do you think? Fat or thin? In my opinion, if my stock show positive distribution, so positive skill, is mean the tail will be on this side, right? Have a chance to get positive return. So you want fat tail or you want thin tail? Fat, right? Which means the frequency is more often. However, if your stock show 
the negative skill, fat tail may not be a good one because you experience loss many times. Okay, so in order to use information on the fourth moment or catharsis, we need to combine with the third one, which is skill. Positive skill, you prefer fat tail. Negative skill, you prefer thin tail. Or if you can choose, you never should stop that experience, negative skillness, all right? Unfortunately, the stock market as a whole in ASEAN country show negative skillness. So it's quite sad. Our stock market experience high negative return. So carefully choose a stock, all right? Okay, this is a combination. So comparison between normal distribution and uh, the kurtosis distribution, you see that it's very peak. It's peak and the tail is bigger. You see that the green one dominate the blue one. The tail is fatter. So you can search the more detail in this manner by putting up fat tail distribution. There are many investment strategy related to fat tail and thin tail. It's quite new as I mentioned. So this is the probability distribution of a stock I showed you at the beginning of the class. As an investor, can you help me which stock you should invest? From here, which one is good? Let's compare BAY to KBank to KTB. Let's compare these three. You will see that all these three stocks offer the same return, which is about 0.11%. What about standard deviation? KBank offer the lowest one, right? Compared to BAY and compared to KTB, right? So in this room, you know that you agree that these three stocks offer the same return. Anyone here will choose BAY? No, why? Same return but higher risk, right? And then no one will choose KTB as well because same return with KBank but higher the risk. So we are consistency with the theory saying that investor dislike risk but investor like higher return. So you agree with that, right? We all love higher return and we all dislike higher risk. Okay, so we consistency with this theory. What about other thing? Can you compare KTB with um, with which one? So, um, let me change. Can you compare um, BBL here? Okay, let's look at BBL. BBL offer you 7% with the risk about 1.77, but here give you 11% with 1.98% risk. Which one is better? Which one is better between BBL and KBank? Now it's difficult to compare, right? Because BBL offer you lower return, but also lower risk. Meanwhile, KBank offer you higher return, but also higher the risk. So in this room, let me take a vote. Who willing to take BBL? It's kind of my research experiment. So please help me contribute to this research. In this room, who will take BBL as your investment? 7% with 1.77. In this room, who are willing to take KBank as your investment? Okay. The answer is quite the same to Malaysian and Singapore, which means ASEAN people love higher return even you have to experience higher risk. Good, which means you are a risk taker. Did you buy a lottery ticket? Did you buy a lottery ticket? Do you buy? 
do it. No, no. Okay. All right. There's a theory that say that if you love to buy a lottery ticket, you are investor that love positive skewness. Remember the positive skewness, right? The tail will be on the right hand side with a high return, but really little chance. That is a theory related to um, the positive skewness. So BBL and KBank is difficult to compare. It depends on investor preference whether you're willing to take higher risk in order to receive higher return or you are conservative people who are happy with low return and low risk. So it depends on you. But when you look at skewness and kurtosis as a combination of your decision making, you will be able to see that BBL even offer the lower return but higher positive skewness, right? 0.1%. And the tail is quite big. It's about 4.7. So BBL even offer average return in the lower level, but offer higher chance to get jackpot, something like that. So I would, what I would like to say from this slide is that once you considering investment for your future, try not to use only two factor, which is mean and variance. Now, try to think about other two elements, which is skewness and kurtosis. Right? So by investing in this kind of stock, you should be able to manage to get high return and somehow get lottery ticket and lower risk at the same time. Right? Why I'm picking this topic to tell you? Because based on my teaching experience, I've seen that many Thai people don't have saving. It's so sad, don't have saving. Some of them have saving. Okay? Why these two are different? There's some lesson from success businessman from Hong Kong. He said that if you want to have saving, it's so easy. The saving is equation combining with three variables, which is income and then expense and then saving. So if you put equation in the right way, you have saving. If you put in the wrong way, you won't have saving. So what is the right equation? The equation for Thai, people, for Thai people will be income minus expense equal to saving. All right. So when we have income, we spend first. Whatever left, that is our saving. So some month we spend a lot, low saving. Some month we spend more than income, we have negative saving which is called debt, all right? Debt means you own something, you own the bank. Debt is, sounds very really similar to debt. So try not to have debt in order to avoid debt, all right? So what is the right equation? The right equation should be the revenue minus saving equal to expense. You got what I mean, right? So whenever you have revenue, you subtract saving first, take it out. Whatever left, that is your ability to spend your money. This is a secret. So easy, but difficult to follow, difficult to implement, especially this female student, right? Whenever you see the nice fashion clothes, nice bag, nice shoe, your equation will be damaged. Okay, shoes come first. Income minus shoes, minus bag, minus this, minus that. So no saving. So it's quite dangerous. So you should be able to learn from today. Actually, there's one book, very interesting. It's called Saving Genes. You know genes, right? Genes. It's talk about how to build the saving genes in you. It's so easy. You have to make it before 25, 
Anyone here age more than 25? No, right? So you have a chance to make these saving genes. It said that you need to set this equation correctly. Revenue minus saving equal to expand. This is the equation first. And then you set the level of saving. That will be challenging, but can be followed in the long run. Let's say 10%. Let's, let's say that I have 100 Hundred of hundred percent of revenue, and then I subtract ten percent of my saving, which means I only have ninety percent to be able to spend. So ten percent is challenging or not? Is enough or not? It depends on people, like me myself. My saving percent is about twenty. Twenty is quite big, but I did that. Have been doing that for a long time since young. So 20%, 20%, in other words, I get used to really simple life, like poor people life, eat cheap food, buy cheap clothes and all that. But then we fix this rate for many, many years. But then when your income increase, your 20% will be increased as well, right? But you still use the same standard of rice. You still drink cheap coffee, you still buy cheap shoes, but saving increase. That is the key. So you have to set that portion very effectively, challenging, but can be followed in the long run. Some of my students, after listening this class, he get motivated. Yes, I'm going to do 30%, 40% saving. I want to be rich in the future. It's very challenging, but very difficult to follow in the long run. You talk about 30% of saving, that's a lot. Some month, you get sick, get into hospital, where's the money? So you need to miss your discipline by taking more money out to spend. You know what? This book telling you that once, just one time, just one time that you break this rule, just only one time, your saving genes gone and never come back into your life. This is the secret. So it's quite interesting. When you save for more, for more than one year, one time iPhone X coming out, you want to have iPhone X, so you tell yourself, this month, can I skip first and buy iPhone X? I will top up for the next month, double, top up for next month. Once you do that just one time, you will not be able to save anymore because you already you know negotiate to yourself and you lose it to that passion so try not to do that start it from now okay this is a secret of saving and what is a mistake for thai people some of them who have saving but no financial literacy they put their saving in bank account you know bank account right put money in the bank in saving account why so bad? In Thailand, the saving account offer you interest rate less than 1%. Really low, less than 1%. But then our inflation rate, you know what does it mean, inflation, right? Inflation means inflate. The price of things inflate every year. For example, you buy one dish of KFC, you spend 100 baht. Next year will be 104 because of inflation. So inflation in Thailand, in average, is about 4%, but your money go up only 1% per year, right? Which means you put money 100 baht in the bank account, next year you have 101, but the same rice will be 104. You even cannot buy the same portion of KFC, which means you are poorer and poorer every year. It's about 3% per year. If you put money in the saving account for 10 years, you are experiencing 30% poor even. So will you do that? Of course, no, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't put money in bank account anymore. So after the class, go to the bank, withdraw all the money, and you can pass to me. I will find the investment for you, all right, to make you become wealthier in the future. So that money you can invest in the stock. Like that, by considering return, by considering risk, 
skewness and kurtosis. Okay, this is the first concept I would like to introduce. You're looking for the investment that offer you 5%, 6%, 10%, or sometimes you are good enough, you can get 20%. So, you know, your wealth will be increased double and double every year, better than the inflation 4%. If you invest and money go up 4%, this is it okay? Okay, you're not richer, you're not poorer. 5% is good because 5% minus inflation four, you become richer 1% every year. But everything less than four may not be a good choice for you in the future. So think about that. You are still young. You have longer time. You have longer horizon to invest to save. Compared to me, still really short time left. Almost pass away, almost die. So I have to think more carefully compared to you. All right. Because just now, before it die, it's shaking. The room was shaking like, I'm going to die. Chain battery now. And then now dead already. Okay. So next slide, please. Okay. So before we move on, I'm talking about one thing that I'm working on right now. Now I'm doing my startup company with some students from the Faculty of Computer Science. I have been invited to keep a talk on finance and investment for the startup company. Mostly they are tech startup. What does it mean tech startup? It means that they are really good in technology and then start a small business, small company in order to you know make their company growth. However, so sad, they don't know anything about finance. They ask someone, they pay someone to do accounting for them in order to submit to the government at the end of physical year, but they never look at that number. Even they pay it, but they never take that number for analysis. So they don't know how much is debt, how much is income. What they only know is they know revenue, they know profit. That's only two things that they can read from the financial statement. There are so many financial statements, right? There are three, isn't it? If you learn accounting, there are balance sheet, there are income statement, and also Really good. You are really good. You know finance really well. So we can take opportunity from that kind of information and make analysis to make your company growth in sustainable way. So in that class, I saw the three students that has potential. So I invited them to work with me in interesting project. So I'm now I'm working on my startup company with these three students. What I'm doing now, we are going to create some apps. I'm not sure it's workable or not, but the app is called Snatch. You know, you know what does it mean, Snatch, right? Snatch means take it from you, Snatch. So my apps with my team will be apps that steal your money every month. So if you load my apps, you set how many percent you want to be steal. Every month, I will steal money from you. You know, you know what I mean, right? So whenever I have suddenly income come up, you set 10%, my apps will steal your money 10% and put in my pocket. And then we will submit investment decision, investment choices. This is suitable for you based on your risk preference profile, which one you want to choose? I choose this one. And then with that investment, you have to spend 9% of that 10%. So we return 1% back to the owner account. So every month we steal their money and ask them to choose which investment they want. Choose this one and then we change back or somehow we spend all of them. We spend 10%, so no, no money return. So doing like that. So it's a kind of, you know, someone forcing you to do saving. And the thing is, that saving won't go to the bank account because you choose investment yourself every month. And that investment is not that risky. It's like negotiable and then has potential to make you become richer in the future. So now we are working on this. Yesterday I'm talking to Dr. Ranga about these apps and he 
you know Dr. Ranga, right? Yeah, he said, wow, interesting. You want to do it in Indonesia as well. So yeah, if you're interested in, contact him, work with him. We will be richer together in the future, all right? Okay, let's move on to the next topic. So I'm talking about portfolio selection. How many of you have heard the word portfolio before? Are you from finance department? No wonder, okay. Anyone else from finance as well? Okay, same, yeah. What does it mean portfolio? Can you tell me? Simply portfolio means the collection of asset, right? When you buy the stock here, just now you choose only one, you choose one, it's called you have one stock, one single stock. Once you have more than one stock, you call it, you have portfolio. So the portfolio is a collection of asset. Your portfolio can consist 10 stock, 100 stock, or 1,000 stock. It depends on you. So we call it portfolio. So we're going to build portfolio. Why? Like from here, which one is a good stock? You compare MR, MRK to MOT, you'll be, you'll be able to see that, may not be able to see, MRK offer lower return, but lower the risk. MOT, slightly higher return, but higher risk as well. So these two cannot be compared. But once you compare MOT with MCD, MOT is Motorola, MCD is McDonald. Which one is better? Of course, Motorola. Because at the same level of risk, Motorola offer higher return compared to McDonald. So we never buy McDonald for investment, but we buy McDonald for eating, right? So, okay, so we never buy McDonald for investment because it's worse than Motorola. We call it, we say that Motorola dominate McDonald. This is a term the terminology that we use in the stock market. We said Motorola dominate McDonald. We said that MRK and MOT are non-dominated choice because no one better than another, all right? So why we need to create portfolio? Somehow we said that we don't know what stock is the best. That's why we need to buy many stock and put in the portfolio. Another benefit will be the portfolio provide diversification. Have you heard this word? Diversification means you try to you know, diversify something by investing in many stock. By diversifying, you reduce the risk of your portfolio. But many of you heard this word before, diversification, but may not all of you understand why portfolio offer you diversification. So this is example. If you buy one stock, just one stock, the total value of your investment depends heavily on the movement of this stock. When it go up, your value increase. Once it go down, your value decrease. So whatever happened to this stock, effect on your investment, all right? And then one company, there are so many specific factors that can increase the price of stock, also can reduce the price of the stock. But look at this example. If you have these two stock at the same time, put together in your portfolio, what can happen? Once the blue one go up, the red one going down, the red one going up, the blue one also going down. This is example from two company. The blue one is a company that listed in oil and gas index. Oil and gas index, so they are selling oil, right? The blue one, sorry, the red one is a company that working on logistic. You know, the logistic thing, right? So think of today the oil price increase. The oil price increase. The blue one will be appreciated, right? They can sell 
more revenue, higher price. But the logistic company will be really sad because the cost increase. They need to fill the petrol in order to deliver the the stuff. So the profit will be reduced, reflect to the stock price reduced as well. But once the stock, once the oil price going down, what happened to oil and gas? They go down, but logistic goes up. Some kind like that. So when you have two stock at the same time, and these two are not related to each other, you have this kind of diversification benefit. So the key of diversification is that you need to combine people who has different strength, or there's no relationship between them. It's very common to your life now as a student when you work as a team, as a group, with one assignment. Always happen to my MBA student. If this group, you know, consists of people from very diverse background, this group always perform well because some of them good in language, some of them good in mathematics, some of them good in multimedia or computer. So whatever I ask them to do assignment, they can create. A good work compared to another group that six of them are engineer, so they are really good in computing, but once they present their slide, it's so boring. It's just plain text, no design, nothing at all. When ask them to do accounting analysis, they may not understand. Ask them to write article in English, they may not be good. I'm only think I'm good in computation. Tell me that. So diversification is the same thing. So you combine the stock that good in specific area, and then it can go up and go down together. All right. So when you have portfolio, is there any theory supported that? Yes, there is. That's one theory. It's called mean variance analysis. is created by Henry Markovich in 1952. It's really old time story. Surprisingly. This theory is still one of the most famous theory used in finance field, in the practical as well, in the study, in the research as well. All right. So assumption of this theory is that investor love return, but then dislike risk. So they try to construct portfolio that offer higher return but lower risk. Okay, this is a key concept. And then the question is: When you put stock together, you don't talk about return, you don't talk about risk, but how stock contribute to diversification benefit? Okay, this is a key thing. Come to equation. I think you have this slide. It's kind of going to vomit after see mathematic equation. So I introduce you only two, which is the first one. Equation to compute portfolio return. The second one is portfolio risk, right? Portfolio return is easy. It's a combination between return of asset one, which is R one, and return of asset two, but multiplied by the bill. The bill is weight. For example, you have two stock. One stock gives you ten percent. One stock gives you twenty percent. You put fifty percent of your money in stock A, fifty percent in stock B. So your total return will be 50% multiplied by 10 and 50% multiplied by 20. Sim simple like that. But the risk equation is more complicated. It's talk about weight. It's talk about sigma. Sigma here is standard deviation. When standard deviation square, it be variance, right? And then the bill two, and then sigma two, and also here. Sigma, sigma, and rho. The rho here is correlation between asset. Correlation tell how asset move together like that. This two stock has low correlation because it move in a different direction. But if stock move together, correlation is high. If stock move opposite side, correlation will be negative. Okay. So which couple is good? The stock having high correlation, stock having low correlation, or stock having negative correlation. Which one is good, in your idea? 
negative, right? One go up, one go down, one go down, one go up. So it helped the portfolio as a, as a total to go up in the long run. So we're looking for the stock that contribute negative correlation to our portfolio. However, it's very rare to see stock move in the opposite side. If you can find, try to put that stock in your portfolio, that would be good. I couldn't find that in Thai stock market, all right? Okay, so this is simple calculation. I would like to introduce you about weight. What does it mean weight? For example, you have 100,000 and you put um, 200 shares of stock A, which cost 50 each. So you invest 10,000 in stock A, you invest 60,000 in stock B, and 30,000 in stock C. So the weight will be 10%, 60%, and 30% respectively. Understand this, right? This is a simple calculation. You invest 10,000 from the total 100,000, meaning that you spend 10% for stock A. You invest 60,000 from 100,000, you spend 60% for stock B. And then 30,000 from 100,000, which is equivalent to 30% on stock C. This is the weight. And then again, we would like to combine these two, Motorola and GM, only two stock in my portfolio. Here, here is my example. Let's say um, Motorola give you 1.75% with 9.73% risk and GM offer you 1.08% return with 6.23% risk. And then the correlation will be 0 0.37. What is return? What is the risk? So this is equation that I will try to put on, but then I still leave the weight blank here. Okay, so it depends on weight. How many percent you put in GM? How many percent you put in Motorola? it will reflect portfolio return and also portfolio risk. Okay, for example here, you put 25% in Motorola, 75% in GM. This is the return, that is the risk. Something like that. This is simple calculation and this is the chart. Okay, what is the key? What is the concept? Why I'm bothering myself to talking about this? I'm going to use my finger instead of this one. If you choose to invest in GM, this is your return and this is the risk. All right. If you choose to invest in Motorola, you have higher return and also higher the risk. But once you buy two stock with some portion, you see that you put 75% in GM and 25% in Motorola. What happened? Return increase, return increase, but then risk also decrease. It's quite interesting because you buy two stock, but then you can combine and create something that give you higher return, but lower the risk, even lower than risk of GM itself. You got what I mean? So this is the benefit of putting stock together as portfolio. So you get some investment choice, offer higher return, but lower risk. But if you are willing to take higher risk, you can get higher return here, higher return here, and here, something like that. You can even combine some investment that give you higher return here, higher than Motorola, higher than GM, but of course, higher the risk. So this is the benefit of combining portfolio, you can get this kind of diversification thing, which is higher return and lower the risk. All right. Let me show you another example. What if the correlation between these two is not 0 0.37, but become negative 1, 0 or 1? Okay, I'll do the same thing. And then this is the result. What is the key from this picture? If these two stocks 
has correlation equal to negative one, at some portion, you can create investment that give you about 1.3% return, but risk equal to zero. Risk equal to zero, which means you invest, your investment has no risk, which is very fantastic, right? That's why I'm telling you that if you can find a couple of stock having negative one correlation, that will be a perfect investment. Unfortunately, so far in my life, I never found that couple stock. So it's your job to find that kind of investment. I think there is, but may not be in Thailand, maybe here in Indonesia. So try to find it. Why we can reduce the risk? Actually, risk, there are two components of risk. One is um, systematic risk and what is unsystematic risk. The unsystematic risk, sorry, unsystematic risk here mean the risk associated to the company itself, for example, oil price, for example, but systematic risk mean the risk that all stock must experience at the same time. For example, there's protests in Thailand, all stock will falling down, right? Or the GDP change or the interest rate change, all stock will get the same impact from that change from that event. So it's called, we call it systematic risk. But unsystematic risk can be diversified away by putting stock together. You see that this is a secret. When you put more stock, you see this is number of stock. When the number of stock increase, the, real, the risk will be reduced. But until the same, until at specific level, the risk may not be reduced anymore because you still have systematic risk left over over there, all right? So there's some research telling that how to reduce this systematic risk. The solution will be you have to invest in other country. For example, if we have protests in Thailand, will there be any effect to the Indonesian stock market? No something like that. Or Trump is president in US, people don't like stock market falling down, any impact on our stock market? No. So this kind of diversification in terms of global thing. So when you invest globally, you can reduce systematic risk. So this is the key, All right? So this is the thing. Apart from theory, this is challenge in practice, which is my specialization. I'm working on this particular on my research, okay? So the challenge in practice is that we use that mean variance analysis to combine, to construct portfolio in order to give you lower risk and higher return by combining stock that shows very little correlation. The practice is that what if we add additional objective? For example, at the beginning of the class, I'm telling you that we prefer positive skewness. Remember that? We prefer positive skewness. What if I want to build portfolio that give you high return, lower risk, but at the same time, higher skewness? So there will be three objectives, right? You maximize return, you minimize risk, and then you maximize skewness that will be a challenge. Or the next challenge will be the large scale optimization. We talk about the stock of more than 1,000. You have 1,000 stock, how you should choose them, how we are going to compute. That is a challenge in practice. And the last one will be the real world constraint. Like you want to invest in stock that not come from the same industry, or you want to invest in stock, not more than 20% of your money for each stock, this is kind of constraint, okay? This is example of additional objective here. Like we want to maximize return, minimize risk, and then maximize skewness again, what gonna happen? Normally it's like that. 
when we try to find a solution is here, we map back to this two panel diagram, which is return, the x1 is return, sorry, y is return, x is risk. So we like higher return, lower risk, right? But then if you want to add skewness, there will be a three dimension, isn't it? You maximize return, you minimize the risk, and then you maximize skewness. So that is a challenge in the practice. Let me show you something. Can you click the red dot over there? So this is example of additional objective in the practice. This approach characterizes assets and portfolios by their expected returns and risk, usually expressed as standard deviation. The mean variance efficient frontier comprises portfolios which offer the highest expected returns for varying levels of standard deviation. Those portfolios that lie beneath the efficient frontier are inefficient. The optimal portfolio depends on an investor's risk tolerance. Risk averse investors prefer portfolios to the left along the efficient frontier. Investors who are more aggressive prefer portfolios further to the right along the efficient frontier. Many investors care about relative performance as well as absolute performance. Risk within this context is defined as tracking error, which measures the volatility of relative returns. We can extend our two-dimensional graph to include a third dimension for tracking error. Now we can locate each asset according to its expected return, standard deviation and tracking error. We can also locate the mean variance efficient frontier according to the tracking error of the portfolios it includes. The benchmark, of course, has no tracking error. We can trace a second efficient frontier called the mean tracking error efficient frontier. It extends from the blue benchmark and meets the mean variance efficient frontier at the location of the highest expected return portfolio, which is shown in red. The third boundary of the efficient surface comprises combinations of the minimum risk mean variance portfolio shown in green and the blue benchmark. The efficient surface lies within these three boundaries. We can slice the efficient surface through an array of portfolios that have the same expected return but different combinations of standard deviation and tracking error. We can also identify portfolios that have the same standard deviation but different combinations of expected return and tracking error. The same is true for tracking error. We can slice the efficient surface through an array of portfolios with the same tracking error but different combinations of expected return and standard deviation. Just as inefficient mean variance portfolios lie beneath the efficient frontier, there exist portfolios beneath the efficient surface that are inefficient in three dimensions. For example, portfolios formed by mean variance optimization but subject to allocation constraints will typically lie beneath the efficient surface. Mean variance tracking error optimization will almost always produce portfolios that are superior to constrained mean variance optimization. Many investors care about both absolute performance and performance relative to a benchmark. In some cases, the benchmark serves as a performance standard. In other cases, it represents liabilities, such as the present value of benefit payments or spending obligations. For investors faced with the dual challenge of achieving absolute and relative objectives, our advanced risk measurement technology offers a superior solution. So there's an example of challenge in practice. When we increase the additional objective, the searching space will increase from two dimension to three. We still can see from the presentation, but once you have more than three objectives, our human ability won't be able to see that. So when we add fourth objective, fifth objective, sixth objective, so we can't do that. We can solve it using the simple um, linear programming thing like Excel or you know some kind of software. So what we have to do is we need to create our own algorithm to solve all this problem. Like in my case, I'm dealing with these three objectives, so I choose to use what we call evolutionary algorithm 
Have you heard about this? It's quite new, right? So it's a collegium that you know kind of um, search by stochastic process, try to find the answer, and then link to the evolutionary thing. For example, we have thousands of population, and then each population has several um, different solution. We try to find which solution is good. If this one is good, we try to make them meet another good solution and produce baby. The concept is like that. We pick the good one and ask them to make a couple, produce baby. So we expect that baby will be stronger than mother and father, and then that will be a better solution. And we need, we use the next generation solution to make the new generation, make the new generation. So we expect that every generation we will find a better solution, something like that. So like here, this is my um, result using the this kind of algorithm thing. So yeah, this is a three dimension as shown in the video presentation just now. But this is something that I'm talking about. We're talking about high skewness and then high return, but low risk, something like that. Okay. And then we talk about large scale as well. Like we want to sort the stock from thousand stock, how you solve it in effective way. Now today, if you want to solve dot in a graph just now with 100 stock, you have to spend like 20 minutes. But my country, there are 600 stock. If you want to find investment solution with 600 stock, you need to spend like one hour to get 10 dot, to get just 10 dot. But you see here, there are like 1,000 dot. So you spend almost one day to get this curve, and then you pick one solution. But tomorrow, solution change already. So you spend another day to come up with another graph and then pick one. So it's very troublesome and time consuming. So I, myself, I create another algorithm to deal with this problem. So my algorithm can solve like almost 3,000 stock in two seconds. Just two seconds, you get this kind of thing. So kind of new area of research. So again, when you have saving, don't know where to invest. This is expert, right? So you can transfer money to me, I can invest for you. That's a key message today. All right, I think this end by my, this is end my presentation. So I will open the floor for question and answer. I think you have my paper as well, right? I send paper to the link. So if you're interested in, you can look at how the algorithm work, how the research is looks like. Thank you. Any question? Okay, thank you, sir, for your time and your insightful lecture. My name is Muhammad Labib. Uh, I want to ask uh, some. I read a book about investment, and it said that sometime in invest we should look for the company profile because there are some kind of uh, external value that can measure, not just the only data. Uh, so, in your opinion, I want to ask: Is it really? compatible with the data or should we just look at the company profile also? Thank you. Thank you very much for a good question. What he, what you ask is about fundamental analysis, right? So yeah, you can do that. There are so many types of investors in the market. Some investors look at the fundamental thing of the company by analyze company profile, looking at financial statement and coming up with suitable value of the stock. If the value, if the proper value is less than the price in the stock market, what you should do? You shouldn't buy, because it's too expensive. But if the value that you extract is higher than the price right now, what you should do? You should buy, because you expect that the price will go up to the value that you think. So this is the way that Warren Buffett and many successful investors has been doing. It's one way, all right. But there are so many ways that technician investors, well, that never look at fundamental 
only look at the volume, the movement of the price, and then try to find a signal and buy or sell depends on signal, depends on algorithm, like that. But it's useful, it's useful. But in my experience, I did that at my very beginning of investment stage and realized that it takes a lot of effort to find the good stock. For example, we analyze 10 stock, putting a lot of effort, looking at comedy profile, reading financial figures, and all that 10 stock coming up with is too expensive. So we threw all that report away. And going to start 11 company, so we ask ourselves, what if it's too expensive again? So we have to throw out this work. So it depends. If you have time, if you have team, that's a good way. But for some investor that no time, no team, so you have to analyze 600 stock in a market and try to search for the cheaper one that crazy. But it's a good way. Any? Thank you, sir. My name is Rafi. So as we know, there are many many apps or people out there that promise to uh, to get your money, to invest, and to make money. But with so many players out there, how can we know which one to trust? How can we know that, oh, this one is legit, this we, we should trust these people or, or this app? Thank you. That's a really good question. <laughs> Even my apps, you shouldn't trust. <laughs> right? Um, fortunately, um, in Asian country, in order to do some business related to finance or investment, you need to, based on the regulation, you need to get license from the government. And to get that license, it's not easy. You have to have money in the stock. You have to follow this, follow that, in order to comply with the regulation. So in order to be proper investment apps or proper investment house, you need to comply that regulation. So, if that apps show that yeah, guaranteed by government, that is reliable. Like my app itself, we can't do that. We're not big enough. You have to be big enough, have big capital, big investment, but we can't do that. So we try to find loops or by we don't take your money into our pocket. Once you do that, it's illegal. What I do is just, you give me the money, it's just hang there, few seconds, when you choose investment, money go to that investment company. Immediately, never pass my pocket. One pass my pocket is illegal. So my ask would be, you choose it, I snatch it, hang there, when you choose it, go to that company and change back to your account. This is okay. The second, the second part that I want to address is that there are many investment companies out, out there, especially for apps, try to be superstitious about them, try to ask so many questions because it's not, it's not easy to create apps related to investment. So my idea will be, I would think this is fake one at the beginning and try to ask more, ask more. Okay, so don't trust investment apps if they ask you to transfer money to them. But if that apps only give you advice, only give you answer, and you bring your money, invest yourself, that is reliable. Because there's no benefit, isn't it? So be careful about that. And the following exchange as well, try to be careful. Uh, thank you, sir. My name is Owen from uh, Gajah Mada University. Uh, you mentioned before about the portfolio analysis uh, using mean variance. Um, yeah, the thing is you have to know the expected uh, returns. Uh, what if I, I don't have the re uh, expected return and I use the multiple linear regression instead? Do you think it's it multiple linear regression? You said this between the stocks you have a correlation so you can use the regression. Do you think it's a good idea to use that? I'm 
I have to address this question carefully because it's linked to another theory, which is um, you talk about regression of the return of one stock, right? So you have to talk about what is regressor. You may regress it with market, but two stock. Uh, you said that there's two correlation between the stocks. Now, uh, can I uh, project the expected returns using a uh, regression? Uh, if I don't have the expected return of investment, because in mean variant analysis you have you have to have the expected. So the answer would be no if you say that because this based on the theory of mean variance, right? We talk about first and the second moment, so it's a criteria. But if you don't have that return, you don't need to follow this one. So you add additional objective, whatever you have that is additional objective, and then. You still can compute variance of portfolio, and then you try to minimize variance, but don't talk about return. Understand what I mean? Um, <clears throat> I said you don't have expected return, right? But then you want to construct a portfolio. So what you can do another way is that you give up looking at expected return, but you find some measure that work in the same way and put it as first objective. And the second objective will be risk according to this framework. And you can put more, and then you optimize it without expected return. That's another solution. You can do whatever you want. Because now we don't talk about mean variance anymore. We talk about optimizing portfolio. So the objective can be set by yourself. But this is a theory, so we put these two as a main element first, and then you add up. Thank you. Um, do you have any advice for the beginners, especially the students who doesn't really have a big income, to start uh, in in the uh, to start investing in the stock market? And uh, what do we need to do before we start? What do we need to know? So the first thing before you. You can invest, you have to open an account. You have to open the investment account that some country restrict. Like in Thailand, you have to be able, um, you have to age above 18. So you can open an account and then put the money in and deduct money. It's called cash balance. So you put money first, whatever you buy, they deduct money from that deposit. Okay, they deduct. So the first stage, if I can advise, I will recommend you to go for the fund first. Fund, mutual fund, a fund that managed by professional fund manager. So you buy as a fraction of fund. You know, like for example, I'm a manager of fund. I have like million USD, so I buy stock. Buy stock as portfolio, and then I cut one piece, sell to you. It's called mutual fund. And then you buy just one piece. But this one piece consists of everything in my portfolio, but just one piece. So the value of portfolio tied to this unit that you buy. So you can start with mutual fund first. This is the first advice. The second advice will be um, <coughs> you can invest in what we call bond. You know bond, right? Bond is another good investment for young people who have longer maturity, longer time horizon, because it's lower the risk, but higher return than put money in a bank account. So you can start by that by just one uh, contract. Keep first, because it's spend really little money, something like that. Another secret that not much people know is that I'm not sure it's happened here or not, but happened in Thailand. When you put money in bank account, in saving account, the interest is really low, right? But when you open the investment account, you have to put money in. It's called cash balance account. Once you buy stock, they will deduct from this balance. You know what? If you put money there without investment, you still have interest rate. And that interest rate is much higher than saving account. 
So somehow when I don't have money, sorry, when I have money but don't know where to invest, I don't put money in my saving account. Put here. It's same liquidity. You can withdraw anytime, even T, T plus two in Thailand, but higher interest rate. It's about one point, one point five percent. But as I told you, saving saving account in Thai about zero point two something, really little. Uh, my name is Triwi Diaz from Accounting Department of UGM. So um, my question is not very far from the previous question. Um, what I want to know what's the difference between uh, foreign exchange and and um, stock. So like maybe you could mention uh, which one is better or like uh, what's the risk, something like that. Thank you. This question is very difficult to answer. It's, it's related to attitude as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure it's true or not, but I was told that invest, investment in foreign exchange market is actually illegal. It's actually illegal. You, you are not allowed to invest in foreign exchange market. So what you see from the internet now, you see that this company is investment house, registered in Singapore, in the US. So, wow, it looks trustworthy. But then it's illegal. But I don't know why people still be able to do that. So many of my friends, the algorithm guy, they try to write the program in order to track the foreign exchange movement and invest. So I asked him, you know what, this is illegal. You can't do that. So how you do? He never take my advice. Secretly put money in. So I asked him, when you invest, can you withdraw money back? I'm not sure. And he said, yeah, he never tried to withdraw money back. But in the balance, show that he has profit, but never try to withdraw money out from the account. So I'm not so sure that this company is legal or illegal. But based on my knowledge, you are not allowed to trade foreign exchange. So my question, if my answer will be stock market is better than foreign exchange market because it is illegal. So simple answer, but it's related to your attitude because many new generation believe that that is, you know, the way that you can create your wealth. It's difficult to tell. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Ricardo from Kajamada University. Yep. Uh, I would like to ask about, so last time, uh, about like a month ago, I joined a seminar where there is now uh, the emergence of technology where AI plays part in stock market in which it gives analysis about the stocks. So these apps uh, uh, uses the mean variance and the cartosis and other uh, and other formulas combined together and then they give analysis which stocks is best to uh, be bought on today's and for the next few days or months. And probably because it's still new, uh, it is still expensive as uh, the price is probably around 20 million rupees. Uh, what do you think about this emergence of technology, uh, this AI that will help uh, the investor to invest in the future? Will it replace the work of the investment manager or Yes, yeah, thank you for question. This is very interesting and it's a trend, right? AI already get involved in the finance um, industry. Even my research, I'm using AI as well. Evolutionary algorithm is a mother of AI. It's um, born before AI. So yeah, it has significant impact on financial industry, especially for people who work in that industry. Because, you know, it can work 
instead of human. But what about investment? I think you think of it as a positive tool because using that AI, you can analyze the big data set within a short period of time. And then you have information on hand in order to help you make decision effectively. So think of AI as effective tool to help you make decision effective, effectively in the future. But talking about the negative thing is that, you know, AI is kind of black box thing. You know, black box thing, right? Like you put data inside. I'm an AI, I'm a black box. So put data inside and then solution come out. You never know what inside this black box. And you claim that this is AI, this is the smartest software right now, but you don't know the algorithm inside. You don't know the process. So you believe in that information based on the reputation of that algorithm, but you don't know what is the process inside. So why we rely on that? That is the next question, isn't it? Um. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Sultan, and I have a question uh, regarding about the short run and long run uh, investment. Because um, I've seen actually a guy that they invest. Uh, I mean, he invested in Apple, like in the first early year of Apple, and then he successfully reached the growth rate of thousands or down ten thousands percent. So basically, how do we figure that um, if I believe in this company, and then I just Think that it will be succeed in the futures. How do we figure that now? Thank you. Thank you for a very good question and very suitable for many of you here as a young investor, young student, and you are potential to be success in the future because you are selected one, right? So it's a good strategy to invest in the long run compared to the short run. Short run means you sell and buy in the short period buy today, sell tomorrow, something like that. So it's considered a speculator. You speculate on this movement in stock price, but in the wrong land, you're looking at the stock as a company itself, whether it has potential to grow in the future or not. So by using that address, his question again, when you want to invest in the long run, you need to be able to understand that business to know in deep about this company and make analysis based on that. But there are two concepts. Some concepts talk about the company that can give you high return in the short run, or the company that you know stable, or a growth company. So if you're looking at the long-term investment, you have to put emphasis on growth factor. You know, there are so many factors that can indicate this is a growth company, this is stable company, this is, you know, a peak, peak time or short term company. So if you want to invest in the long term, looking for the stock that show or indicate many factors related to growth thing, something like that. Another thing I would like to address is that when you have longer, longer investment horizon, you can roller coaster yourself. Roller coaster yourself. For example, this has happened to my, my friend. He worked as an engineer in one company for 10 years. So every month, company deduct his money, put in pension fund, and he can choose what he wants to invest. So he choose like really safe way 30% in stock, 70% in bond. So low risk high return, uh, sorry, low risk, but also low return, 10 years. Compared to his junior, just joined company three years, okay, three years. But this boy, he's so young. At the beginning, he chose 100% in stock, 100%, and choose the portfolio that really risky fund. You know the stock, right? And then there are many funds. He chose the most risky one. Surprisingly, three years working compared to 10 years of my friend, the net value is 
quite, you know, compa comparable, same. So as a young investor, you can lower cost. You may choose the risk investment at the first stage. When you get older, you adjust, you change your, your policy, you change your strategy along the way. And when you almost retire, you can move all your fund into safe investment. So there's no fix. You don't need to fix how to be risk for whole life. You can change it accordingly. Uh, you mentioned that you mentioned that in diverse, uh, diversifying stocks to reduce systematic risk uh, is by investing stocks to other countries. So does a negative correlation between two countries systematic risk uh, will also be beneficial for for investors? And what are the challenges and constraints that this practice practice have? Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, systematic risk of the two countries. Thank you for question. And you talk about investment in two countries that offer lower correlation, right? To reduce the risk. Yeah, so it's a good way. That's why you can see that there are many investors from USA, from Europe, come here to invest in Indonesia or invest in Thailand. We have, you know, foreign board as well. Only concern in practical about investment in other country is exchange rate. Only one thing, exchange rate. Because when once you want to liquidate your investment, you need to convert money back to your home currency. So that is only one risk. However, there are many, many fund, many mutual fund that help you to invest in other country with the fixed effect of currency exchange. Now it's very innovative. So think of more benefit than disadvantage. So my name is Latifa. Uh, I want to ask about, uh, is uh, the practice of day trading a good thing? So you buy and sell the stock on the same day. I just want to know about it's your good opinion. Good. The answer is, it's good if you can make profit. It's bad if you lose money. So there's no fixed rule, right? But if you are good, you can do that. You buy cheap, you sell expensive. But someday you may not be able to do that. Actually, based on the theory of efficient market hypothesis, we say that no one can beat market all the time. No one can consistently beat the market. So you may be in good, you can make profit every day. If you can do that, the answer will be yes, it's good. If you can't do that, you don't have that skill, this is the way to help you. You don't know which stock is good, you don't want to buy and sell every day, form a portfolio and then let it work for you. So this theory just help majority of investor. So, but for me, I try, I recommend not to do that, try to invest long term. Because, you know why? That's one thing that people never tell you. There's a commission cost. There's a commission cost. Once you buy, you pay commission. Once you sell, you also pay commission again. So you have cost of buying and selling tied to your investment all the time. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Irfan Shah. Actually, I just want to know uh, why would why would a company decide to, to do a stock split and is it, uh, is it can be used uh, as an indicator for the investor uh, whether is it bad or good? Yeah, 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 it's a factor when the company decide to split the stock or to combine the stock, but it depends. I can't, there's no, there's no um, consistency answer for, for that question. It depends on situation, it depends on the type of company, why they want to split the stock. Or they do it after being take over or before. There's no rules for that uh, signal. I can't address this question. Hey, thank you for the lecture, it was really interesting. And 
I want to know, don't you think that you said that in Thailand there is every year 4% of inflation, don't you think that as more inflation will bring like more positivism to the stocks market and more positivism to the stocks market could lead positivism? I'm not, yeah, like, yeah, but sometimes too much positive can't not lead like into a crisis or something because like if everyone is really positive in the stock market, everyone will start buying so this could lead into a crisis or not? Um, question will be when people start to invest too much money in the stock market, what will be impact, right? The impact will be is good because once money get into stock market, mean people want to invest more, what is a good impact to the company in the stock? They can get money, they can get capital with lower cost of capital. You think of now, if no one invests in the stock market, company want to raise money, they're selling stock, no one buy. So they don't have money to operate the company. So they need to go to bank, offer the higher interest rate. So when people invest a lot, they provide liquidity to a company, they set in stock market. And actually there's a, there's a relationship between investment and economic growth. The, Many research say that the direct investment or the investment in stock market has causal relationship to economic growth. Country that people invest a lot in stock market will have higher growth than country that didn't. There's a research support that as well. So it's not a problem. It's a good, good science. Um, sir, my name is Nafia. I'm from UGM. Um, so UGM here. here. Uh, so recently, uh, fintech exactly has been emerging, and one of the things that I would really love to know is about the peer-to-peer -peer lending, peer-to-peer -peer lending, peer P2P, P2P lending. So, um, like, there's a firm who actually uh, g uh, connects bor borrowers and also uh, people that who actually love to lend their money, and then their advantage is actually. Um, if bank, they can actually like uh, dismiss uh, us, a person with really, really bad uh, credit history and stuff. But in the peer-to-peer -peer lending, they have uh, several credit history. So like if you actually have a bad history, you can actually still admit for a loan like that. So like, um, uh, no, in this case, um, they are actually uh, trying to attract investors to uh, put their money there and then like invest in their, their diverse portfolios. So uh, in your opinion, what are the factors that could actually attract um, these uh, investors? Because usually they they actually quite have a fluctuation in like the terms of returns and those stuff. But what are actually the factors that could uh, attract them? It's like personal investors, not not, yeah. It can be private investors, yeah. It's usually only um, the apps. Yeah, yeah. It, it is actually mostly on a website like that, sir. So sorry, I take a long time to absorb. You talk about crowdfunding and then what is a factor that attract that kind of private equity to buy or to give you money. So it's not related to finance anymore. It's related, related to your product to your innovation and to the potential of your company, right? But the crowdfunding investor always look at the company that has potential product that can be marketable in the future and not only marketable in the short term, but can be developed by using R&D to create something new and add value to the company. The classic example I'm sure here, many of you watch the movie that talk about Steve Jobs, right? Have you watched about that? Steve Jobs running the company, selling computer, and then investor came in. You know what is the classic scene of this movie from finance perspective? <laughs> Steve Jobs, no doubt, is very good in technique. He can develop, create something magical in terms of Technology, unfortunately, Steve Jobs never learned finance, isn't it? And then he never put emphasis on it, so he get 
angel investor to invest in the company. He can expand the production line. He can sell more product. But remember one scene, he was kicked out from the company by the word of board of director. Fortunately, he managed to come back and then kick that guy out using financial literacy again. So yeah, as crowdfunding, we're looking for potential product, but the owner of company itself, meaning you, as a startup company, don't underestimate financial literacy. Even you are very good in product, but you, ha you have a lesson, right? Steve Jobs is a great guy. He's been kicked out, so don't be like that. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Kevin from the uh, Gajamada University. Uh, I'm actually asking for your experience. Uh, have you ever uh, made a mistake in investing? You mean buy the wrong stock? Yeah, something like that. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. He asked me, um, have I ever experienced um, buying the wrong wrong stock, right? It's always happened. Always happened. And I think it's happened to everyone. Actually, there's a classic sentence from professor, many professor in uh, Australia. He told me that he's a pro professor in finance. He said, look at this professor in our department. None of them, none of them never lost in stock market. They are such a great professor, but everyone lose in the stock market. Some of them stop investing. You know why? Because sometimes when you learn a lot, when you know too much, you try to think deeper. You try to make analysis more and more. But the factor that impact investor that fell in the market is not their analysis. It's their, you know what is that? It's their their own attitude, their own feeling. They allow their feeling to interfere the analysis. You think of robot, you think of AI, they analyze the same thing as what we do. This is a figure, this is the ratio, this is a number, and then they buy and sell according to that. But as a human being, you analyze two company, this is good, big company, Another one is small, just happened. You look at the figure, the small one better. So you put your heart inside. How come? It's a small, newly open company, get a better figure than that one. So you decide not to buy this company, but invest in that. You don't believe in what you just analyze. You believe in yourself. You allow your attitude, you allow your emotion, get involved in decision making. That's why we always fail in the stock market. Mia as well, always. Uh, hello sir, my name is Isna. Uh, speak my name is Isna, yeah. I'm from UKM, uh, I want to ask. Uh, for a beginner Sorry. in stock trading, uh, what time we, we should start to buy and sell the stock? What time should we start and sell the stock? Yeah, start to buy and sell the stock. Buy and sell? Yeah. We start to invest? Yeah. Now, when you should start to invest, right? No, I mean like, uh, when we should uh, start to buy the stock and when we start to oh, sell. Okay. <laughs> when we should buy, when we should sell. Yeah. If I can give you the answer, I may not be here. I should be relaxed in some nice beach with big castle, right? No one know when to buy, when to sell. If you know that, you'll be rich. So you need to make anal analysis based on that. And then, as I told you, there are many ways, like your friend asked, as his fundamental investor, you're looking at the price, is suitable or not cheaper or, more, or too expensive? Or you're looking at the technical thing, as a sign to sell or buy or not. So there are plenty of way to make decision whether when you should sell or when you should buy. But there's no such a technique that can beat the market consistency. 
you never seen that. How many Warren Buffett in this world? Just one, isn't it? Which means fundamental work well for Warren Buffett, but may not work well for me, or some techni technical investor that success. There, not everyone that use the same tool will be success. At that guy. There's one example which is um, what is his name? James James Simon. James Simon, I have 10 minutes left. James Simon is professor in mathematics from, um, I'm not sure from Yale or Columbia University. He's a professor in mathematics creating some theory. And then he set up his company, Hedge Fund. He recruit many PhD students and professor in mathematics, physics, finance, and computer science. So in his company consists of about 150 employees. So everyone, what he do every day, just try to model something, thinking of new algorithm, and try to you know find the opportunity to make profit in the short term, even one second. Even one second, they can search for that. It's called arbitrage opportunity. Like you know, the stock, the orange here is let's say 100. Orange in Jakarta is 95. It's same orange but different price why is like that so you should buy orange from jakarta and sell here so you get profit five so this is arbitrage profit there's some company try to find that opportunity and close the gap but that opportunity can be closed within millisecond because everyone seeking for it and there are many algorithms that try to find this opportunity and ready to transfer the money to close that opportunity so there's no such a consistency solution when to buy, when to sell. The best way is you think it's good, buy, keep it for long term. When you think it's not good anymore, you sell. Not buy and sell, buy and sell. Not good. As I told you, there's a commission cost that's higher than your return. My name is Emmanuel. So uh, for someone that is a risk adverse, I believe that it is better to invest in a, in a bank account but then again, so my question is, is it better to put a lot of money in one bank account or in several but adequate amount? Thank you. Money in bank account. Yeah, Maybe. a lot but in one bank account or several but adequate amount or less. Actually, same impact, no. You talk about return, right? If you talk about return, because bank is quite competitive in everywhere, so they offer the same interest rate. And then most of the bank give you interest rate based on daily basis. They compute interest rate every day, give you every day. So you put money today, you withdraw tomorrow, that's interest rate embed in your account. So if you put money in many account, what is the benefit? Diversification? Probably different interests between the, the I think it's quite competitive. If you put money in the same country, but if you put money in other country, for example, when I did my PhD, one of my friends from Iran, you know Iran, right? Iraq and Iran. Interesting thing is that in Iran, the inflation is about 14%. 14%. In Thailand, I mentioned 4%. In Iran, 14%. So the saving account offer you about 12% interest rate. It's look a lot for us, but not a lot for them. Because they get 12%, but inflation 14. So nothing for them. So I asked my friend, can I open an account in Iran and put my money there so I will get 12% every year? He said, no, cannot. It's account only for Iranian people. So I asked him, can I give you money and put my money in your account in Iran? He said, yes, I can do that. So I did that for about two years. And then he put your money back to me. So happy, 12%. But exchange rate risk, as I told you. In Iran, that's a funny story. You know the French toast, right? The bread. He said that this the bread selling in the supermarket with specific price. So for the next year, with the inflation effect, 
you have two choices. You want to buy the bread with the same size, so higher cost, or you want to pay the same price but a shorter one, so in Iran like that. Because 14% inflation impact on the size of the bread. It's quite funny. Thank you. My name is Felisa. And I will, uh, based on your presentation, is about economic finance, right? Uh, we talk about how the investor to sell and buy based on the fundamental techni uh, technical and from uh, the successful invest, invest, uh, investation, uh, yeah, uh, based on the uh, uh, market. Uh, but I want to know about developing uh, academic in uh, finance, uh, especially behavioral finance, behavioral finance. How, what is your opinion about behavioral finance? Uh, I have a lecture from my, uh, yeah, maybe last uh, semester. Uh, as we believe in economic finance, uh, we, we say that behavioral finance is anomaly. How about your, fin uh, your opinion about behavioral finance? Is uh, better or, or we, uh, we can avoid uh, about the investor psychological in capital, uh, for understanding capital markets. Yeah, this is a good question and quite new in the finance field of research. We talk about behavioral finance. So how your emotion get involved into your investment decision making, right? Same here. Just now we talk about skewness. Remember, we talk about skewness, which is against the theory that set since 1952. So this is something of behavioral finance. We talk about, we know that if you buy stock, many stock put in portfolio, the risk will be reduced. So you eliminate unsystematic risk, only systematic risk left. However, we found that majority of investing account consists of not more than five stock. So meaning that most of investor use their emotion or behavioral Thing, impact on the investment. You know that you buy five stock, you cannot get diversification. But why you do that? So we analyzed more. We found that most of the account have some return, some risk, but very high skewness. So it's kind of another factor that related to your behavioral finance. And also, we talk about efficient market hypothesis as well. There are many behavioral things that impact on stock market. Have you heard about January effect? January effect. Like the stock price will be going up crazy on January, but really low on December. This is something that impact by behavior of investor. Like in Thailand, in Thailand, based on my, my analysis, we found that on Wednesday, on Wednesday, the stock market offer highest return and on Friday offer the lowest return. This kind of behavior that cannot be explained by any theory. But you know, people want to sell in order to spend weekend with happiness, don't want to think about Monday what can happen. So it's have significant impact on finance field of research. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. Yep. My name is Ulaya. Uh, I think your snatch application, the saving investment application is very interesting yep. because it really helps maybe a lot of people who want to save their money. That's why I want to yep, know more. Uh, actually, what kind of risk management that you can give to your customer who invests the money in your application? For example, I don't know what kind of risk that may be having, but, but have you planned such risk management or guarantee that you can give to? Uh, yeah, yeah. So based on my, my original idea, I talked about apps I told you last night. Um, it's, we offer the solution based on the fund, not individual stock. So that fund itself managed by professional fund manager. And the fund manager has a lot of money to be able to, you know, hedge some risk by buying some hedging instrument. So as a fund itself, it's already safe. It's not like, I introduce you, you want to buy this stock, just one. It's not like that. Give you like a whole bunch of stock as a portfolio. So customer can choose which fund is suitable for your risk profile. Some fund invest a lot in stock. Some fund 50% in stock, 50% in bond. Some fund even put 
more money in, you know, the labor cheap instrument that higher risk but higher return. So if you love risk, you choose that option. If you don't like risk, choose this one. And that fund managed by professional. So the risk is managed already. Morning, sir. My name is Brenda. And if I'm not mistaken, you said that we should invest in the long term, right? Because some kind of cost. So I'm just curious, how long is the long term? Like, I mean, one year or five year or okay. how many? What is the definition of long term, right? Mm. What is the definition? One year is considered short term already. One year is considered according to theory, but short term for practical investor, short term mean one hour. Buy now, next hour already sell. Or buy now, next five minutes already sell. So there's no definition in practice. But what I want to encourage you to do for long-term investment is more than 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Why? Because you don't look for next year wealth. But my main goal is how you become happy retirement person. So you think of when you age 60, how many how much money you should have in your account. And then that money when you have a 60 should be working for you at the rest of your life. So I always write an equation for my student, like at 60, I will ask them first, how much money you want to use in a month after retire? Okay, this is amount, convert to one year. And what do you think, how old you can live until you die. Let's say 80. So you know already you need to use this amount of money for 20 years. So we calculate back how much money you should have at 60. And then from now, 25, how much you should invest in order to reach or meet that obligation. So this kind of simple calculation, but so effective. So this is my definition of long-term investment. All right. I think I would like to end my presentation here. Excellent already. All right. Thank you very much for your consideration and hope everyone enjoy and good luck.